Hello and welcome to a very special episode of The Highway Ghost. Today's episode is going to be about the Heaven's Gate. Now, if you don't know who the Heaven's Gate is, it's an organization that was formed in 1974 by a man by the name of Marshall Applewhite and his partner, Bonnie Nettles. The Heaven's Gate would be a religious movement, organization, but more commonly known as the UFO cult because their sci-fi themed belief in movement towards extraterrestrial based ideology would get them world famous. And also by the year of 1997, they would be recognized in the media as the death cult being that 39 members, including Marshall took their lives in belief that they were going to be leaving this world in a UFO following Haley Bop Comet that had appeared in the sky during that time frame. The event here was kind of a private, sort of underground type of event, and there's going to be a lengthy lecture with original lifelong member Sawyer, and he's going to be also performing some of his music, which is very talented, and talking about his time with being with the organization, and also down towards the end of the lecture, there's going to be a Q&A session so that the audience can participate with their questions and information that they would like to know about this famous story that has went down in not only the occult history, but also true crime history of the United States, and what would be also known as the largest mass suicide that ever took place within the U.S. So this is kind of an interesting and bizarre story that I wanted to share with everyone. So let's meet the Heaven's Gate. Yeah, 
second or so, I did a right angle turn. I mean a real right angle turn. So that it was, if it was going to continue in that direction, it would have went into the Gulf of Mexico. Seconds here. So before it would get too too far low to you know go into the Gulf of Mexico, it did another right angle turn. So it continues to go in a southerly direction. So I watched it go out of sight. All of about three or four seconds. And I wasn't on any drugs. myself at the time, I wonder if that was intelligently driven. The thought I had was, well, probably. Name he took in about 1978. Uh, his first name before that, with the media concern, was in 1975 with Bo, as in Bo and Pete, because they, they had silly names at times. And T, uh, um, was his partner in the 1970s when they awakened together to, to the same information. Even though T was on the forefront of helping Doe wake up. But then they both were waking each other up. But the way that Doe talks about it is that T had to put up with a lot of the things that Doe wanted to do. And that was her task. Because Doe recognized that T was actually his senior, his older member, his actually in the archaic 
religious terminology is Heavenly Father. And, uh, and that the religions have all gotten off track uh, from what they started as. But they can still be stepping stones. But the main thing about religions is to get into them and get out of them because they hold you back in terms of growth. <coughs> anyway, how I started, so I went to a meeting. I saw a poster on the, I came out from an all night jam that I had with my band. I was in Newport, Oregon on the coast and uh, I came out of that the next morning after an all night party kind of thing. I saw this poster on the telephone pole and it said UFOs, why they are here, uh, when they will leave and who they have come for. And then it talked about two individuals were here from this evolutionary level above human. And that poster is one of these slides. But uh, it was intriguing to me. And so I looked at it and I thought, what do these people look like? You know, I thought, you know, from outer space, you know, it was kind of what they were saying. And uh, so that was one of my first questions that I had in my mind. And the other thought that I had on the poster said that there were people that were giving their all to this effort. And that intrigued me also. Uh, I had been a spiritual seeker, you know, meditation and uh, dancing with the Sufis and all kinds of uh, reading books and uh, Yogananda, Yogananda and Paramahansa Yogananda, sorry, I don't know if I mispronounced his name. But uh, a lot of things, Bhagavad Gita, and I just wasn't finding anything that was really captivating my attention. And because uh, I, I came from like, a, I, w I wanted to see science behind all this. And I wasn't a Christian, but I thought that Jesus was somebody special. So I was raised in a Catholic environment, even though I wasn't really Christian. I was just, you know, going to church on Sundays and that was about the amount of it. But, uh, which I rejected early on. Anyway, so I went to the meeting, and they sat there, and they were like we are. We're not trying to pretend to be them, by the way. Some people accuse us of that. But, uh, and they were quiet at first. And uh, then they started to talk, and it was like, this is, you know, I was just interested. I was just listening. And I remember seeing a haze in the room. Like it was a room that was probably not lit much more than this. And I could see, you know, to my left, like as if people were smoking and I didn't, I didn't smell any smoke. I was an ex-smoker, so I think I would have noticed that. And then I could see around them, there was all this hazy stuff around them, shimmering light, uh, shimmering hazy stuff. Were you know, prone to hallucinations before then? Well, I, at, the, at the time I was a, uh, avid uh, marijuana smoker, but I never saw things like that you know, during uh, those times. You know, I did some mushrooms. I did a lot of acid in my youth, but I wasn't doing that anymore. This was the 70s after all. Right? Yeah, this was the 70s. <laughs> I mean, not all people don't do that anymore. <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know either, but uh, I imagine people explain that so. uh, But uh, so. And then they started talking, and there was a full room. There was like 200 people in that room. Uh, it was bigger than this room. And uh, and someone from the back that was standing in the back, I think, maybe not, uh, shouted really loud, you ought to be shot. And I didn't know where the hell that was coming from. But I think it was right after T and Doe were talking about how <coughs> to become a member of the level above human, because they didn't talk in religious terms very rarely um, as, uh, until the night. <coughs> then Doe started talking in more religious terms sometimes in order to relate to the people that came from that background. Because uh, the entire human kingdom is a school, and, uh, and everybody is growing at different paces, different rates, and different degrees. So. Uh, in order to communicate, you know, it, it's uh, it's necessary, I think, to try to address things in ways that people are accustomed <coughs> to understanding. So 
So, but at the end of the meeting, uh, you know, Doe had been talking about uh, when that lady said that. I think it was a lady. I don't. I don't really know. I mean, you know, just it was a, a higher voice, or I mean, I've been a female person. But uh, um, he was talking about how there were individuals that felt so strongly about following this process. They called it of making a transition from being a human to being a member of the evolutionary level above human. That's not human. It's not mammalian. They don't do any of the things that mammals do. They don't reproduce. They don't, uh, they don't have the plumbing for you know, uh, sexuality. They don't have any sexuality. Uh, they, they don't desire it. They don't need it. But they had to but the human kingdom is designed to have all the options that it has so that people through experience could choose by their own volition to outgrow certain behavior and ways, like anger and you know, even though there's an appropriate time for anger, but I don't want to get into all that. But so anyway, so what they said was at that meeting that children couldn't join. And that's because children aren't capable of, they haven't gotten into humanness at all. So there's nothing that they're going to be challenged by to cease those behaviors and ways. And they're not mature enough to make a choice of giving all their effort to this changeover of becoming a new creature, and it's, they described it as a metamorphic process, just like a caterpillar goes to a butterfly. Um, uh, you know, that caterpillar actually, that, that biological material actually dissolves into a goo that they don't understand how it all of a sudden then evolves into being a butterfly and now has wings. But the same kind of biological changes can happen to the human body and happen to the mind, and the mind is the most important part, even though we need the human body in order to learn lessons and have experiences. So, so that person was saying that, I think, because that was like saying that to join them on this process meant that children had to be left behind. And, uh, and that was the case, and that was a tremendous controversy at the time and there were some individuals that had children and uh, what Tienda said uh, that they weren't to be abandoned but they uh, that the next level would help them find something that would be uh, beneficial for the families that were being left behind because you also had to leave behind your spouse your brothers and sisters because those are all human relationships and in order to start a new relationship to a new family, it's actually a family of members of the next level above human, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, whatever you want to call it. Um, all those separate, one needs to separate from all that, um, those ties, those binds, those, and, and as well as addictions to things in the human kingdom. And that's the plan. Right. It says Bay Shore Inn in Oregon, Walport, Oregon. You were okay with leaving all your family behind, all your possessions? Well, I had done so already, but actually, uh, because I, I grew up in New York, and as soon as I was able to go to college, I went to college, and then after that, I you know, uh, had a friend, and I moved into an apartment with a friend, and and uh, and then I moved to the West Coast. I went to Canada first, and I got kicked out of Canada, and because uh, I was trying to live in the bush, way back in the woods in the Wells Gray Provincial Park, and uh, and so I got I ended up in Oregon. And at the meeting, how old were you? At the meeting, I was 24 at the meeting time. Yeah. So I I, had, I didn't really have any ties. I had a partner. And uh, she joined the same time I did. We went to the meeting together. 
Um, and, it, and we didn't stay together. And I knew that was going to be the case, and it just made sense to me. Uh, and uh, that I needed, that I wanted to give my all to something. You know, people say, oh, well, they wanted something bigger than themselves. Well, what's wrong with that? You know, I mean, you know, ourselves is nothing, really. Uh, in some ways, I mean, I'm not putting anybody down. But for me, I mean, uh, uh, I guess I didn't build a big ego at the time because uh, even though I was, you know, playing in a band and stuff and had a little popularity, it wasn't, I don't know, it wasn't that fulfilling to me. It's, you know, I, I just wasn't interested in the things that other people were interested in pursuing. And I think that's because uh, the mind that was associating with this body we, we call a vehicle is, uh, well, has a certain amount of experience with it so that it knows certain things, even though it can't prove them. But I think we're all in that department, that there's certain things that we feel like we know without having proof of it. And we can be deceived by thinking we know something. You know, that it's a, it's a, it's a tricky place to be. And, uh, um, but so after the meeting was over, what did what did T and O say? They said that if there was anybody that was interested in more information uh, to uh, stay after, and there's individuals in the audience that uh, will answer your questions. And uh, I, I looked to my right, and there were two people sitting at the end of the row that were looking at me. Some people had left by then, so there were some empty chairs between us, and uh, and they saw that I was looking at them, and, and they came closer, and uh, I said to them, well, uh, I want to go with you, I want to go with you. And I didn't have any strong ties, so it was easy for me in some ways. I didn't have any children. I didn't have any houses. I didn't own anything. I was almost broke. Uh, but that didn't weigh into it. I mean, I was able to get along. I had odd jobs and stuff. I did, but uh, but just it just felt like you know, I tell people that you know people say that when they have a near death experience, the light passes before, before their eyes, and that's what happened to me. I felt like my whole life seemed like I was there. Happened for the reason of being in this spot now and having this choice to. Um, become a student of uh, these two individuals that were at that time called Bo and Pete, uh, or, you know, or not. And that's the way it was every day with them. Uh, it was always a choice. There was never any uh, manipulation or, or um, you know, like I said in one of the documentaries, uh, they didn't brainwash us. They gave us the tools so that we could brainwash ourselves, wash our brains out of our humanness. And that that's not an easy thing. And I don't even, I didn't know what that meant. I had no idea what that meant. I thought I did, I mean, a little bit. Uh, but in essence, uh, there was a lot more to it that I didn't recognize, even when I left. So I didn't recognize. To go back to that meeting, you went up to the, those two individuals came over to you. Do you remember who they were? Yeah, Logodi and Sunodi. Logodi and Sunodi. Um, and then what did they tell you to do? How did you actually like join up with them? They, uh, let's see. They told us to meet up with them in at a campground in Corvallis, Oregon. No, Eugene. Oregon. And uh, it, it said, tie up their loose ends of your life. Don't leave a mess behind. And, uh, and meet us at this park. And so I did that. I didn't have any loose ends to tie up for me. How <laughs> many other people from that meeting joined and met up at that same park? 34. Yeah, it was the big. It was the biggest meeting of joy, people joining. So you got to the park and were T and O there? Like, no, what did you no, do? it was it was Norody and I don't know who a partner was. I don't think. 
they stayed in the group very long. But uh, they were sitting at a table, a folding table, in the middle of the park. <laughs> yeah, and there were no trees anywhere in that spot. And just, and there were people milling around them, you know. And I didn't know who those people were. But you figured that's where you needed to go. But I saw that table in the middle of the this field. And so I went up to them and I said, you know, um, and they said, well, okay, well, you're, uh, meet us in, um, um, what's the name of that park? Uh, Colorado National Monument in the campground. The Colorado National Mar Monument near Florida, Col Col Colorado. And, uh, and, you know, uh, I think, is Nerodi the one in the glasses back there? That's Saul Nerodi. That's Saul Nerodi. Yeah, we have these names. The That's names were Nerody, like, right? like, for instance, the name Saul Nerodi. When, when we joined, uh, they said that since you're going to be trying to become a new creature, you need to take a new name. So pick your name. And so, like, the one person took the name Saul. And then, uh, years later, T and O said that the next level was adopting us, and so we were going to be given like a last name, and our, our first name was going to be shortened. So Song became S N G, no vowels in it, and then the name O D Y was put on the end of it. And they said when we grew up to be more adult, they would drop the Y, so we'd be the family of Odd. And that was a joke, also. They, they had a good sense of humor. But, um, yeah. Because we were pretty odd, you know, there's no question about that. And, uh, so yeah, that's how the name came about. So I had the name, well, I ended up, Joe gave me the name Sawyer. And that's a little story at the time, but I won't go into that. I, I talk about all, a lot of details in, uh, I have a blog post called Sawyer's Story. That's on uh, my blog, which is Sawyer HG, like in heavy gate, dot wordpress.com. And if you want to read that, you'll know, get a lot of detail that I, I can't take the time to fill in now because there's so much to cover. So you're in campgrounds with this group of people and you're doing what? We're living like anybody else lives. We have to Because lots food. of people live in campgrounds. <laughs> no, no, but T and Don would find, uh, see at the time when I joined, there had been already 20 or 30 people that had joined. And then there were another 20 or 30 that joined after that. But when I went to Colorado, then we got instructions to go to Boulder, and we were camping in this just, I don't know where it was, but T and Don would find us. How did you places get to, get to these places? We had cars. Okay. They, to, they told us to you know, bring cars in camping gear because we were traveling and we were sleeping outdoors and, uh, and bring any money. To, you know, um, and I had $50 that I donated, so we, that's all I had. But uh, they ended up paying me for, for me to live for three years. I didn't have to work for them. That's a dollar stretch for you. Yeah, right. That's for the, there's Sawyer right there from the Beyond Human. Yeah. And his partner was a uh, Ginoti for that. And I cut my hair. I had long hair like this when I joined. And I just knew that I would cut my hair off and I'd go to I shave my beard because they didn't want us to relate to anything that we were in the past. Like anything that we were attached to or, you know, thought about. And then you weren't supposed to think about the past. I mean, there was no way of knowing whether somebody was thinking about the past or not. Um, but uh, if you if you didn't do it, then you missed out on the things that you could be occupying your mind on, which was always challenging because one of the things that they did early on is they assigned us a partner, somebody else that was going to be our mirror of showing us all the things about us that um, someone else might have problems with with the overall thinking that whether it was something that a member of the next level would do. Like I'll give you an example. Uh, let's say uh, somebody uh, um, 
I'm just going to say something stupid. I was picking their nose, okay? And, and the other person said, you jerk, you know, stop doing that. Remember the next level wouldn't approach it that way. They wouldn't say that to that person. They would say that maybe that's not the kind of hygiene that a member of the next level would have. And they might not know for sure, but all, all these things got reported to TNO, and so they would come back and say, yeah, use a tissue when you're trying to clean something out of your nose, you know, uh, instead of just using your finger. So, so that, that's where, like, partners were, like, let's say somebody got angry with somebody else, you know, because the look on their face looked like they were angry or something, and, you know, and they got into an argument about something, you know. Members of the next level wouldn't, uh, they don't get into arguments. Um, I mean, they can have dis disagreements, um, but they don't, they don't get all emotionally charged over being right. That's why members of the next level, they're kind, they're generous, they're thoughtful, they're thorough in, their, in the jobs that they do. They, uh, um, they don't waste time. Uh, they know how to you know, uh, be fast, quick, and without looking like they're quick, without breaking things. And uh, because they know how to cut back on motions that aren't necessary for a task. And they're very real. They, they operate on spacecrafts. And those spacecrafts can be as big as a planet. It can be, they can have a laboratory inside that planet. And uh, that's teeming with activity, scientific activity, you know, uh, studying what's happening on the Earth, and with, with all kinds of computer screens that are showing scenes and able to communicate with people, actually, because they have radio wave communications. And humans don't have, the next level gives humans everything. Everything humans know came from the next level. If, if the next level didn't provide it, nobody would know anything. We'd still be in the cave, eh? cave and, 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 and uh, if there was an A uh, <laughs> uh, in the cave times. So but let's go back to the campgrounds. You guys were in campgrounds for how long? Um, till about 1980, sometime 1980. So from 75 to 1980, 81, you're living in campgrounds, just traveling in caravans. Yeah, yeah, going, we, we lived in Wyoming for a long time, and Kendo were always upgrading us when they could. And they had received some donations that were sizable, so they were able to pay for all our needs. We had about, uh, about 100 people in Wyoming when we first stopped doing public meetings in 1975, or six, in July of 1976, <coughs> we finished with the meetings. And uh, for, the, for like 16 or 17 years, we didn't do any public interface at all, hardly. Because uh, they weren't looking for more people. They didn't want more people. More people meant more work for them. And they weren't into being propped up by people. Because they, T and O were serving their older members, and and that's the way it works. So that uh, you've got older members in the next level, and you've got younger members in the next level, and there's degrees of that because everybody's still growing, um, and, and and that leads up to the most experienced member. That's how you actually judge age. It's not by time because they don't have time like we have. Uh, they judge time by events, and uh, and so the more experience somebody has with tasks, um, uh, the more um, the more mind they actually are uh, filling their soul pocket with, their soul container with. It's actually a physical plasma-based container that uh, is like a chip. It's got a computer chip in it, and it, it grows, and it's actually literal. It's like uh, an organic computer chip in your body. Yes, it is, and and the next level has to give human vehicles that chip, otherwise they don't 
they, they can't really grow their soul unless they have that chip given to them. And we never know who's got one and who doesn't. Because it's not a matter of whether you have it or not. It's a matter of whether you grow it or not. And everybody can grow it at their own pace. Uh, it doesn't matter what terminology they use, if they follow no religions, if they're atheists, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, everything in the human kingdom is an opportunity. And, but, but there's, uh, but the behaviors and ways um, are where the growth comes in and how we act towards one another. That's why the older member from the next level that was called Jesus, uh, he said the greatest commandment was to give all your love and all your strength and all your mind and all your uh, uh, heart, your, your emotions to uh, deity, deities. You know, the word God's been distorted so much that it's like, uh, it's almost meaningless. But, um, but members of the next level are deities to humans. Even the youngest member of the next level is a god to a human. Because of their capabilities. Because of their capabilities and their perspective and their overview and the fact that they've overcome all their human nature. And they've become this new creature, which which was given a, a new physical, dense physical body to wear. Where the so in other words, the soul grows and becomes more dense, but it doesn't it, it doesn't function in the physical world that the next level has as well and created for this planet as well. And so they they grow dense physical bodies, and I think there's a picture of one, these pictures are too grainy. That's uh, oh, a series. That's the anyway, so you're learning all this while you're in a campground because they're holding meetings, or? Yes, uh, yes, right. Because you guys didn't have jobs at that point. No. So you just like wake up in the morning and just mill around in the campground, or? Yeah, that's about it, I guess, well, uh, well, no, it was more structured than that. It started off like that, kind of, but, like, after we were done doing the public meetings, because um, before, when we were doing the public meetings, then we would get up, we would make some kind of breakfast or something, you know, we had a stove and, and, you know, water and food and, we would make some like, you know, cream of weed or something, you know. And then we'd go into town and we'd put up posters for the meeting. Some people would find a meeting place and uh, we'd put posters up. We'd talk to people in the town. And, and so pretty much then we'd go back to the camp and, you know, have a meal. And, and sometimes T&O would call a meeting. Yeah, sometimes they'd call a meeting. And at that point we were in like six different camps. So they would make rounds sometimes. But it might be days in between that happening. Oh, popcorn, wow. <laughs> oh, I'm Would you like thing. something you all right? Yeah, you I'm like good. I'm you good. sure? Yeah. It's fat free, well fat, sugar free. Well, we want the fat. Too. All right. <laughs> 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 yeah. We got a movie screen and we got some. What do you see up here? Yeah, we're trying to provide some entertainment. I hope it's. So you're in campgrounds, and then basically the money runs out because nobody is working. Well, in the campgrounds, though, after we finished with the public meeting, that's when it became serious. And T and uh, we were down to about 100 people. We don't know how many there were before that because people would join and then drop out. And, you know, we'd go to the next town and we'd say, "Meet us in the next town. We were going to do a meeting." And they wouldn't show up, or, or they would meet us in that town, and then they would say, oh, you know, and then go somewhere else. So it ended up being like 100 people in, in Wyoming. So it's not like some traditional cult where they were like, you have to stay with us, and you can't leave. And no, no, nothing like that. You guys ever. weren't staying up 24 hours a day being no. indoctrinated. No pressure, no pressure, no pressure to stay, or no pressure to leave. But when Tino found out that some people were still having sex and still smoking pot when we got to Wyoming, they said, okay, that's not gonna work. 
So if you want to do that, fine, but you're going to leave the loop. And, uh, and some people did leave because of that. And, uh, and then, because uh, they said that we're getting down to business. Because, uh, and so they started giving us exercises. Like one exercise was, um, let's see which one I'm trying to talk about. The wall of Tuning fork? Yeah, that was one of the first things they gave us, actually. They, uh, we had like six camps in the Wyoming, and we were living in the National Forest. And... Um, Medicine Bow, right? Medicine Bow National Forest, right, between Laramie and, Wyoming, and Cheyenne. And that's been made into like a park now. It's kind of an official campsite there. But at the time, it's really cool. Yeah, at the time it was uh, completely rustic. There was nothing there. You know, we, we dug holes in the woods to do our number two and, you know, stuff like that. So, uh, so they, they, each camp had uh, two students that were assigned to be like uh, group coordinators, they were called. And uh, so they gave them a tuning fork, each one of them, in the six different groups and so that there were. And uh, they said that the tuning fork was just, you know, you know, hit it against your knee or whatever, you know, some hard object, and then hold it to your ear and listen to that tone. And it was it was 440 pitch, the A tone, you know, in the, in the scale. And uh, they said that this can help you tune into something to get your mind off of the past or uh, that it's freezing cold or really yeah cold anything or that was challenging you not that they wouldn't have done something if it was freezing cold because we had sleeping bags and we had blankets and you know we, we weren't mistreated like that uh, and uh, uh, T&O were always uh, I mean they weren't there were challenges, certainly were challenges. There were times when it was, you know, below zero and, and the sleeping bed just wasn't cutting it. And, uh, but by and large, we moved from the cold areas to the south, to Texas, so, so that we wouldn't be in those extremes. Uh, you know, in, in the winters down uh, in the south and in, in, in the summers up in the north. Um, so, the tuning fork is just, you know, you use it, you take turns with it, and use it once a day, maybe, twice a day. There was no limit on it. And you just hold it to you, or put it on your head, and you hear it vibrating through your head, you know. It's really cool if anybody has yeah, it's, it it wasn't, to do that. Yeah, it, it really wasn't a ritual, you know. When they, when they put this in the documentaries, everything that I'm talking about now makes it look like this was a ritual, and we had to do this, and you know, we had to do that, and, and if, you, if you didn't do it, then you were going to get a bad grade, and, or you're going to be reprimanded in some way, you know. I mean, yeah, if you didn't use it, then you weren't taking advantage of whatever experience you could get from using it. But it, it was all, you know, uh, optional. I mean, it was, you know, op optional to a point. Like, there wasn't an option to continue to have sex with your partner or, uh, or, or smoke pot, because those weren't behaviors that, those were human behaviors. And they weren't uh, wanting us to continue human behaviors because we weren't gonna graduate. Now, before I go any further, uh, whenever I say graduate, some people think, oh, does that mean, does that mean killing you? Well, no, it does not mean killing you. And in fact, if you go to the heavensgate.com website, there's a document there that says our position against suicide. And it, it's, it's a little bit hard to comprehend how could they be against suicide when they committed what humans call suicide, which I argued in, on the 60 Minutes show was not really the right word for what they did. Because they didn't leave this world because they were upset with their mother or father or their spouse or you know they were just trying to be back at somebody or because they're, they're they lost their money in the stock market and they couldn't live with themselves anymore or, or you know or because they were so depressed that they just wanted to you know 
do drugs and, until they died, you know, had an overdose or didn't care anymore about living, they weren't, you know. They didn't leave for that reason, any of those reasons. Those are, those are actually less than opportunities for humans. And humans need to have their physical body in order to learn lessons. And when we overcome things that were dragging us down by our own choices, um, then we are growing. Our mind is growing. Our strength of mind is growing. And, uh, and we know it. Anybody that's overcome like a, a strong addiction knows that they are in a better place than they were before. And they still might be tempted, but and they may fall off the wagon, but they maybe get back on the wagon, you know, because, um, I mean, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with people using the substances of the earth, you know, but if it's altering our consciousness, then we're not going to be able to have clarity of thought about the things that are most important for our consciousness if we have a sense of wanting to grow, to become a better person, however you want to think about it. And the next level is observing everybody that has a thirst to grow. Not everybody has a thirst to grow. Some people are in a different grade in school to where um, you know, certain lessons are appropriate for them to have that doesn't involve like, you know, uh, trying to find the meaning of life or something like that. You know. um, uh, not that, I mean, I guess, I guess, see, when I joined, I wasn't necessarily thinking I was looking for anything. But I was. I was never settled where I was. I was always traveling to find a better place to live. <laughs> and, uh, and I was, you know, experimenting with reading books and things that, you know, about subjects that were interesting to me, about spirituality or ghosts or, you know, or whatever it was. I was interesting in, in all that. <coughs> that. That's thirst. That's one way of thirst. I mean, you could have thirst to be a, uh, somebody that wants to find a cure for a disease, you know, or, or wants to help be of service to people, you know. Uh, is a kind of thirst as well, and you know, to to make an invention that might improve people's lives, you know, uh, or you know, to, to raise children in a in a way that those children can, you know, have the best life that they, they can have. You know, that's 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 all these things are opportunities in the human kingdom, and the next level is working with everybody to some degree that is showing signs of wanting to be more than they are. So I don't know how else to say it. before um, I want I want you to talk about uh, so uh, probably I don't know how many people know but uh, T and Do when they would give meetings they would record those meetings on little um, tapes cassettes because um, there weren't like there were computers but there wasn't I think the internet was maybe just coming around in the 80s somewhat but there wasn't any of that yet so they had this little tape deck and they would record all the meetings and there's over a thousand hours of those meetings that are recorded they have been digitized they are in various places on the internet that we're not allowed to share because we're being sued for that um, the two individuals that manage the heavensgate.com website are suing us um, but we don't really want to go into that because they'll try to use that against us. But the reason why I'm bringing that up is because in these audios, T and Do talk about all kinds of things, a lot of the things that Sawyer's talking about. And in one that we just recently listened to, um, T was talking about a procedure that they had, like, they did certain things in campgrounds, like, so I want you to talk about, like, the colors, because I think this is a hysterical story, and I couldn't stop laughing when he told me about it. So, like, you guys were wearing, like, a, a uniform, like a jumpsuit with a bag over your head? <laughs> yeah, that wasn't the first time we had those colors. But yeah, the colors, they were, they were the, first. That was the uniform something. before that. 
we had we were wearing overalls. Why you guys were like on ranch land or something? Yeah, we were living on uh, in national forest, or in that case, uh, Tindo rented a big, many, many acres of ranch land, and we had a big tent set up. Which, uh, we buried our generators, and so we had lights and everything. So we had a pretty big operation there, you know, in, in terms of our, our group there in, in uh, Northern Colorado. But uh, one of the, they had, they had the sewers of the group, you know, the department, um, make these jumpsuits out of this nylon, what nylon, polyester, I think. Uh, <coughs> Them so that it wouldn't be too hot in the summer and it wouldn't be too cold in the, you know, it wouldn't be too cold in the winter. You, know, like you can wear clothes underneath them, very baggy. And, uh, and they wanted us to learn to overcome judging somebody else by their appearance, by the, their facial appearances, their facial, what they, you know, the, look on their face or if, if well, let's say uh, okay in the next one of the things we had to get rid of um, was the, uh, gender consciousness because members of the next level don't have a gender so you're building your mind with their behaviors and ways because that mind is in ends up being in the next level in a, in a vehicle that doesn't have a gender so if you were still had the gender consciousness, that would be a type of uh, disease or something. You know, I don't know, disease isn't the right word. But it, it was, you're not going to actually become a member of the next level if you have too much of that characteristic in you because you won't fit in. Uh, I can't really explain that in a very good way at this point, but um, so maybe it's not necessary. But, So, because human vehicles can be attracted to the same gender or an opposite gender, or, uh, even though that word is being used in different ways now, I'm just going to say male and female, um, uh, we had to overcome that consciousness. And they even said that uh, people that were leaning towards what was called in the old days homosexuality, LGBTQ, and the other words that are associated with that now. Um, yeah, non-binary and all that. But, uh, <laughs> we don't want to get canceled, right? Yeah, right, right, right. It's very sensitive. Yeah, so uh, our individuals that have are showing signs of having overcome some of their gender consciousness by by not being, you know, turned off by being with somebody of the same gender in a sexual way. Even though there's no sexuality in the next level either. So it doesn't mean if they overcome their gender consciousness, they haven't maybe overcome their sexual consciousness. Because there is no sexual consciousness in the next level. So that's another thing that needs to be overcome before they leave. That's why we were all celibate for all those years. And or a celibate of mind and body. So you were trying to stop those thoughts from registering in your head. So one of the things that they did to help us not, you know, favor somebody else or, you know, pay more attention to somebody else or treat somebody differently was they designed out of the same material that these jumpsuits were made out of, they made these hoods. And they had elastic bands on the inside and they had a screen that was like a, it look, looked like a, What's that, Wabi the Robot? I don't know if you all know, it was an old TV show from the 50s, I think, uh, that showed this robot that had like this rectangular uh, eyepiece that was like silver, you know, silver and black. And it, it was only one way. You could only see out of it. You couldn't see into it. So you couldn't see the other person's eyes or anything. And so we wore those hoods, uh, not all the time. I mean, you didn't wear them to sleep. 
But, uh, but before you had the hood, you had paper bags, right? <laughs> the first part. I was just like imagining bags. like a hundred people wandering around on this like ranch land wearing hoods and jumpsuits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, and, and so the procedure was right since we didn't, you know, T and Bill were called the UFO cult and. And they were investigators looking for us, and the FBI thought maybe we were responsible for cattle mutilations, which could have been further from the truth. And uh, but those are the kind of things that people were looking after the group, looking for TNO to try to find out and try to pull their loved ones out of the group, even though everybody was an adult um, and was not there against their will, which I can testify to. And, uh, but even though when like an airplane would come overhead, uh, we would have two people that were on duty all the time, taking turns every hour, uh, watching out for planes or, or if the rancher that owned the property was coming up in his pickup truck, you know, coming close to us, then we would, they would sound the bell and we'd know to take our hoods off. So that if they were had binoculars in the airplane, they were looking down at us, this group of people in this tent, <laughs> they wouldn't see you know, that kind of thing. And they'd be, what's going on down there? You know, that's some kind of government thing going on. You know, uh, of course we were accused of that too. You know, they, people said that the whole group was based on MK Ultra uh, and the mind control experiment by the government, which couldn't be further from the truth. We had nothing to do with the government. I don't know that as a fact, but all these stories come up, you know, and, and once they get out there, that's Pluto. That's not Pluto, these. <laughs> you distracted. Yeah, these are like scarab beetle. So the team that compared like themselves to the scarab beetle, the way the young would follow the, the attached to the well, there's that cool dad. story that Doe was telling in one of the audio tapes that he had given him a scarab, uh, a, a ring with a scarab mm -hmm. beetle on it. Right. And she had like, a, I don't know if it was like a vision or something, but she like, where were they? Were they in Vegas? And they went into the shop and Doe said, I want the scarab ring that you had. And the guy was like, I don't have anything like that. I don't know what you're talking about. And then Doe, whenever they were looking around, and the guy was like, he remembered that he did have something like that. It was in the back or something. And so he gave him this ring. Um, T and Doe got arrested in Brownville, Texas, uh, in what the eighty, the seventy three, in seventy three, before they had anybody in the group. Actually, it might have been. No, wait, wait, it was. Yeah, it was seventy four. They got arrested for uh, keeping a rental car too long and uh, using a credit card that a uh, member, uh, a student of theirs, their first student actually had given them to use for gas. And then her husband later reported that card is stolen. So uh, T and Doe were in Brownville, Texas. They wanted to tell people what they had, what they'd been awakening to. And so they contacted a reporter and said, we've got this huge story for you. The reporter assumed it was about drugs about the cartel or whatever, because they were so close to the border. So he brought the cops and to this hotel, and T and Doe were looking around and seeing all these like men in black, and they're like, "Holy crap, we got to get out of here!" So they jumped in the rental car and they took off driving, and the cops followed them. There was a helicopter that landed in front of them, um, and they got arrested. And they both spent time in jail. And while Doe was in jail, he gave that ring to somebody for protection, to protect him. So that's what happened with the scarab beetle ring. Um, with I think that, that, that bug is actually meaningful in the Egyptian, Egyptian mythology, yeah, right? Definitely. Um, with, we can go ahead and take an intermission. And then, um, since it's right at about an hour, and then um, we can open the floor for questions, if that sounds good. Everybody? Yeah, I want to go first. Who is on first? Um, I think you mentioned that Jesus, I hear you kind of briefly talk about Jesus being a member of the next level. Mm -hmm. Are there any other like historical like members of the next level that we've kind of seen? Who would those be? 
Yes, well, during this civilization, because it's not the only civilization that's been on Earth, according to Tim Miller, uh, um, it was uh, the beginning of the experiment here of growing soul started with what was talked about in the Bible as Adam. And he was part of that as well. But uh, Adam was a member of the next level with a next level body that uh, was given certain tasks to do, knowing that um, the next level, before that happened, there were individuals that graduated into membership in the next level that uh, were given some elementary tasks to do. And they became known through uh, legends and mythology as the false gods, or the fallen angels, or the, uh, um, the Luciferians. You know, not, not that Lucifer's a bad name or anything. Uh, Tell me your and, comment, you would make your kids that right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's questionable to do that to somebody, you know, these days. But then again, you know. Uh, anyway, so, so, because of the choices that that individual soul made um, and those that followed with that soul to where they started to go against the next level's design for the way that they grow the garden, the planet of souls, uh, they were restricted to the earth. Earth became their jail. They were given many opportunities to change, but they didn't take advantage of those changes. Maybe some did, I don't know about that. But for the most part, those that fell away uh, went against the next level, and they, start, they started to lose sight of the reality of the next level, and started to think of them as another space alien group. Because what we're talking about are people from different planets that the next level brought here in order to have an experiment of subjecting souls to that same influence of those, those fallen angel souls, the space aliens. And uh, so that began the experiment, okay? And when Adam broke the instructions that he was given, uh, uh, then, uh, then he was actually restricted to being here. and. But over gen seven generations, he recovered. And he left that same soul that was in the vehicle called Adam, uh, left as Enoch. And uh, Enoch left a lot of records uh, of, of the relationship of those fallen angels with humans. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then after that, and he, and he went back to the next level. He took his body with him into the, ne into the next level. He, he transitioned it from a human vehicle into a next level vehicle. And that's the transition that Jesus also demonstrated. Uh, okay, then uh, after that, uh, that same in the soul came back and took the vehicle that was called Moses. And that started uh, a classroom of souls that they were preparing. And that's why people in the Jewish community think of, some of the people in the Jewish community think of themselves as the chosen people. Because at that time, they were chosen by the next level to be part of that experiment of growing souls using human vehicles. But that was like being in the sixth grade, the lessons there. Well, put in a in the twelfth grade system, so they were like toddlers. And that's, the, that's why they had to have strong measures of saying, okay, you, you can't kill each other. You know, you got to learn some rules because the next level is going to require them to become more advanced and not be so primitive and animalistic because you're going to have to outgrow that mammalianism in order to become a member of the next level. So, uh, so then after that, then there was a, another task that was done by that same soul. After Moses left, Tiendo felt like Moses, his vehicle was also taken. 
even though the scriptures don't really say that clearly. So anyway, so they said that then that same soul came back in the in the vehicle that was called Elijah. And uh, that was a different task than what Moses had. It was actually to show the difference between the lower forces, you know, the, the space aliens, gods, the lesser gods, or the, the false gods, as opposed to uh, the real members of the next level. And uh, but they had students also with those, and there was there were student souls the whole time, except for the Adam time. I don't know that there were other. I mean, there probably were, because there were always souls that had grown in a previous civilization that were brought back to have more lessons. Um, that's that's what the next level does, because you you don't learn to become the next level member from one lifetime in a human vehicle, even though it's not the same exact thing as what's taught as reincarnation. It's, it's related to it. Anyway, so then after Elijah left with his body is the way that the story goes and that's what T and felt to happen. But they didn't say everything that everything that in the Bible wasn't isn't accurate accurate necessarily. Uh, some of it is, you know, a great deal of it is, but you know, there's stories and things, but some of them were have been distorted from what was originally given because that's what the next level allows to happen in order to give us the free will and to believe it or not kind of thing, or to, you know, to try to find the most right meaning of the things in, the, in, the, in those written records. They're historic records, they're not, they're not uh, religious material, really. Um, anyway, so, so then that same soul, after he did the Elijah task, came back in the Jesus task. And, but that was a different task. That was like taking people right to graduation requirement to give all their love even though Moses taught that you need to give all your love to God you know, essentially uh, in order to qualify um, which is you know that's been distorted too but uh, uh, but but he said that but Jesus but the, they weren't ready the souls that came back with him that had been with him when he was Moses uh, that graduated from that the ones that didn't fall away or didn't you know that the next level saved for future opportunity uh, they weren't ready to graduate yet to become full adult members of the next level some of them might have been. You know, some of them might have been taken into the next level and given a next level vehicle, a next level grown like a vine kind of physical body that they would think of as a suit of clothes that they wear for certain tasks. But they might have those tasks for on earth might be trillions of years. You know, in the next level it would be days, you know, or, or a month or two months, you know. With the, with, the, with the comparison being like a thousand years on Earth is like one day in the next level. Like, do you, like uh, the May the Mayans say had a, I can't, does anybody know what the, what was it, Ted Tokan or something like that? A person with blonde hair that came out of the ocean and taught them how to be civilized. And then in Egypt there was Osiris and Isis and, uh, We've got Muhammad and Buddha. Would you say that those were representatives yeah, good point. the next level? Well, yes, yeah, some of them, some of them are. Because some of them were student tasks. They're not older member tasks, like the prophets in the Old Testament. Some of them, you know, like probably Daniel and probably some others, uh, Isaiah maybe, and uh, maybe most of them were probably student tasks because, uh, like, even the task that Jesus did, the soul task was Jesus. Uh, he did tasks before that, in addition to the Moses task, and it appears that he was the Archangel Michael. But Doe never said that, because he, they weren't trying to be those people. They didn't feel like they, they didn't, uh, they didn't derive any ego from thinking that they were somebody great in the Bible, or in the past. Uh, they said in particular in 1975 that they are not Jesus. The reason why, but they were from the same family as Jesus. 
And the reason they said that is they said that Jesus wasn't coming back with that vehicle, that same body. Because it was a different lesson program. And, uh, and, and even Jesus said that. Don't believe anybody that comes to Jesus. And you had all these people in the Christian religion that uh, over the time have said that they were Jesus. You know, and you still have people, you have people now saying that they're dough coming back again. You know, it's the same kind of thing, the same pattern that keeps on happening because the lower forces hate the next level. They are working against the next level. They think they're a, a space race that are going to uh, destroy the Earth and destroy them. And it, it's, it's true in the sense that they're not a space race. They are evolutionarily above human and above the space aliens to a degree that is equivalent or even more than the distance between a human kingdom member and an animal kingdom member. That's how far advanced they are in every way, biologically, chemically, you know, mentally, uh, technologically. Uh, the space aliens. You know, the, the so-called conspiracy theories. So like when people are getting abducted and probed, that's by lower forces, space aliens. Yeah, because the next level wouldn't do that. Like, at first, Tian Do wondered, thought that <clears throat> sightings of UFOs, like in the 50s and 60s and the, the contactees, that was all next level activity. But then they would hear the stories from abductions and things that of uh, having sex on board the spacecraft, and they knew that the next level wouldn't do that because the human kingdom is their environment for that experiment, for the human experiment. It's like you know, can you really have a good experiment for growing animals uh, in, a, in a zoo? You're not going to have the same circumstances in a zoo. I mean, sure, you can produce offspring and stuff, but it's not going to be the same as what happens in the wild. And so the human kingdom is the wild to the next level for animal growth and animal behavior. So they don't, I mean, they can still pick up a human, and, but, and you know, maybe give it some tests, but that human wouldn't be affected by that in a negative way at all, like the way the space aliens affect humans. And, and then some of the humans that are abducted think of themselves as, you know, they were enlightened by the space aliens and they become like ambassadors for the space aliens for, you know, that kind of religious format. And they're, they're not, it's not, I mean, it's pretty easy to see the differences once you learn what the differences are. Because uh, um, the next level doesn't have any spirituality. Uh, they don't, you know, they don't worship. The word worship to do meant to work for the next level. Service, giving service, is is uh, and, and service is an honor in the next level. It's not like looked down upon, like in the human kingdom. Sometimes people think, oh, you know. Um, so, so service, okay, that comes to my question. Okay, um, I need to know the practicality of this. Y'all are living out in the woods. Where are you getting money from? Everybody's working. You did say that there were some donations made, yeah. but I mean, you gotta get like just normal things that need to happen. Y'all have women out there, they need things. Yeah. So, where, mm -hmm. how, how does this practicality like work? They got some sizable donations. But from who, what? Well, some of the members who joined. Paul Lodi had an inheritance. Okay. Yeah. Like and he got thousands. Yeah, he was thousands from a family that was pretty well to do, and okay. he was given a trust fund. Trust and fund. another oh. member had a That's trust funny. fund of some sort. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. They were able to get some of that. Just like their parents were pretty happy. That's how they were spending their money. Yeah. yeah. So then, yeah. That's yeah. funny. She thought we would leave from the wilderness. You know, being out about, you know, having no place to lay your head, you know, that, uh, like being Bedouin. And that's the way we were for those years. But, uh, but then she realized that we needed more lessons. Uh, There's a lot of things to learn, so she moved us into, at first she tried to get us, we got jobs, like I got a job at, in Provo, Utah at the Kmart. And I was living in a tent in the mountains at the time and uh, not with them 
Yeah, it was with them. Oh, so oh, everyone was in the mountain. Okay. Yeah. And then you come down into the town to go to work. And right, work. right, exactly. And uh, but the, so they experimented with having some of us do that, and then they realized that that really wasn't going to work very well. And as so far as camping and working at the same time. Yeah, because schedules and things, you know, transportation, you know, all the issues that everybody has with you know, Taking jobs. Taking baths. Yeah, keeping up on our standards, because we took a bath every day, you know, a sponge bath in the car, I'm not in the car, in the, in the tent, you know, to, to, to stay clean, even if it was cold, you know, you heat up the tent with the stove and it'd be good enough, you know. Anyway, but, so they, they ended up uh, renting houses, big houses, right? And, and that was off the tracks. That was using the track. Well, yeah, they still had some funds to do that to get started, but then we all, about a dozen of us got jobs. And then we supported ourselves that way. And then they escalated the jobs so that we got better jobs. Because there was computer programming or yeah. something. Yeah. I, sta I started working in restaurants. They asked who wanted to do it, you know, who wanted to get a job. And I said, yeah, I'll do it. You know? And so I went and got a job at Pizza Hut. And and then you know, and they were making like 20, 25 up to fifty bucks an hour in the eighties and nineties. Well, with the computer stuff. Yeah. We, okay. we ended up forming our own little company. About to say pizza? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, not in those days. Yeah. Well, like they when they exited, they were in a mansion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I mean, that's what I was trying to. Seven thousand a month they were paying for that. Yeah. Yeah. So, but they had their own company at that point because mm -hmm. we actually. At some at some point, see there were some students that had college degrees in tech in IT, like Mill already. Uh, it's not on the screen. Now. Oh, it's off. No, it's coming. No, it's on, but the lights are on. So um, but yeah. so Mill already, uh, she was uh, a computer programmer and she learned COBOL, and so she became a manager for corporations. Uh, and Nora already was a technical editor. And she became the head of the department of technical editing in uh, um, what did, what's that company? Not Apple, but uh, Microsoft, IBM, IT. Hewlett Packard. <laughs> Hewlett Packard was where uh, <laughs> Miloni worked for Hewlett Packard in the programming department. You guys work for Xerox too. Texas Instruments. Mm. She was a technical editor, and manager of Texas Instruments in. Uh, Dallas, I think it was, and uh, and they ended up making pretty really good salaries. I mean, I got paid pretty well too, but I didn't, you know, make what they made. But uh, and, and then we formed little uh, little. Uh, Sorority and I ended up forming a little company called ThinkLink, and another one called Wordwise. We would go out and get computer programming contracts, and we did a few. <coughs> we did one for a Houston bank. And, so, you know, they, they were always trying to have us do the best job we could for the employer. But we had requirements. You know, we weren't going to work overtime. And uh, if they wanted overtime, then we, that wasn't the job for us. And, and they wanted us to escalate our, the money, and they wanted us to get office jobs, because at first we were working in restaurants. But the problem with that was that uh, they couldn't hold meetings as much as they wanted in order to teach the class about the things that were going on. Because, you know, it's, it's hard to really imagine, except in any organization, you've got all kinds of people that don't get along as well with each other, and you've got complications at the jobs that happen, and how to handle things. And, and T and Do are using everything as a lesson opportunity. So you know how you how you like work with your boss, like when I was cooking, and uh, like I got, I got a lesson one time that uh, uh, because they told us when we got jobs that we didn't want to get dishwashing jobs, we want to try to get something that would pay a little better, and you know, and uh, and so uh, I went and I, I was at the job one time and I was working on the line as a dinner cook, and uh, and. We got backed up on, on dishes or pots and pans and stuff. And I, I let the, the chef wash the pots and pans. And I, I forgot how it happened, but Tindo found out about it. 
and they said to me that said Soyote, you know, the name that I had, uh, um, you were misinterpreting our intention for you not to wash dishes. Because when you when your when your boss is actually washing the dishes, you should at least go over there and say, Can I can I do this? Can I help you with this? And then let him say, or her, in this case it was a him, say, you know, uh, uh, no, you stick to the, you know, doing what you're doing on the line. Which, you know, so that was a lesson for me to not, to not misinterpret the intention of the instruction. To not do a dishwashing job. But to be of service to my employer. As long as he wasn't asking me to do something that was against our principles. Against our principles, or was it against what T and O wanted you to do? Those were our principles. Oh. What do you mean, wanted us to do? Well, like, well, I'm gonna send these people out of work. You're gonna come back and bring the money back. I mean. Well, you know, but T and O weren't living off the high and the hog. They weren't putting money away. Yeah. They weren't doing any of that. There's no evidence of that. No Rolls Royces or just the, yeah, so you know, just you, want a house big enough for everybody. No, we had nice sometimes houses. Sometimes we had two houses. We had nice cars too. Had we had three. Cadillacs sometimes, and but we drove the Cadillacs too. Yeah. And uh, and um, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the media has worked so hard to make T and O and the students look evil and brainwashed and that they had this all this motivation uh they were so hard but they have no evidence of it you know, well that's why it's cool to listen to the audio yeah, because there is no evidence they of were it. teaching their class yeah they on it everybody believed what they were there for like you can see in these shirt they're not wearing fancy expensive right. clothes everybody had like a communal closet so like when you're shopping for 40 people it, you know, it costs money when you're feeding 40 people. When you got 10 cars to, I don't even think you guys had that many cars, but no, there's like a lot of logistical stuff. It's like, we okay, three big houses we have, at one point. Yeah, we've got two houses and 10 cars. Where do we put all these cars? Like some cars always stay in the garage. Like, right, there, it's true. Like, out that we were people were just people like, in the house. <laughs> Right, you'd have 30 people living in one house, so it's like, it's not like, well, everybody go out for a walk at the same time. Some people probably didn't come out of the houses because they didn't want to draw attention to themselves. And we not that they were being nailed. Yeah, right, because the nails are like, like how, the same. yeah, there's 30 people in that house. Yeah. They all have the same haircuts and they're wearing like roughly the same kind of clothes. Yeah. Like what the hell is going on over there? So like maybe 10 people wouldn't come out of the house. And they would maybe come out. Well, the at same people were assigned to do the jobs outside, yeah. like to take care of the gardening the and the mowing the lawn, so that the neighbors would only see the same people. And if the landlord came over, there was like, like I remember you telling me that you and I can't remember who was your partner, Chuck Odie. Chuck Odie. We and were you guys were like the married couple, and yeah. so if the so we played like we were married. So if they were going to come over, like everybody else would leave, and then Soyote and Chuck Odie would be there to be like take the inspection, everything's fine, nothing weird's going on. And if workmen came in to, needed to come <laughs> to the house to fix something, uh, everybody would hide in the closets. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, because. Well, no, because we didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> because we didn't want to be interfered with. Yeah. That was the main thing, you know. Leave us alone. We're not disturbing anybody. We're not breaking any laws. And that was the way it was. Besides all single time. occupancy laws. Yeah. Right, right. Or right. Either ways, or, right. Yeah. right. But we were I mean the houses that we were renting were left in better condition most of the time than what we found in that. And they were Oh, yeah, there's plenty of really tapes nice they're place. talking about like we're redoing the blinds, we're redoing the floors, let's repaint, we like it smells like, like they did all kinds of stuff to the house. Because TNO were always trying to upgrade our environment so that we would it would be an uplifting environment, even though and they would decorate the house so that it looked normal to a human that would come in if the realtor had to come in for some reason or because we didn't own these houses. Yeah. We, we were renting them most of the time. Sometimes they'd be there for like 
couple weeks, couple months. Yeah. Hardly ever less did they stay in place for less than for more than a year. Because there were they're investigators looking leaving. for us. They were looking for some of, some of the students. So they bounced around from like Texas, uh, a little bit in New Mexico, Arizona, California, Utah, Colorado, Wyoming. And approximately 1990. They went to Atlanta once. Doe said that. <laughs> briefly, briefly. <laughs> Doe had an, held a meeting in about 1990, and he says, uh, he said uh, that we've made enough money now that we can offer two thousand dollars to anybody who wants to leave, because we don't want we don't want them to stay here, um, because it's become such a comfortable lifestyle. Because it, it was much better than. Uh, working in the world the way we do now because if you lost your job you're not gonna be threatened to lose your house you're not gonna be threatened to lose your car your kids aren't gonna go hungry you know because you have other people that are taking up the slack for the job so uh, it became very easy to live and the people that we were living with we were all getting along really well by then especially by the 90s I mean, not that we were getting along. So the cult that. that offers their members money to leave. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you something mm -hmm. about it. You know, that when I would tell this to the people in these documentaries, they would never use that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. They don't want to make it look like there was something different than all the others. All the others are different. You could get up and leave any time you wanted to. I can prove it. I can prove it by lots of details, and there's other people that are former members that can substantiate my proof. Okay, next yeah, question. Next about question, that. yeah? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I have like two questions mixed in one. So like in the religious realm, things like defying outside of quote normal society is already kind of intense. So your belief system might be considered at that time very intense to other people, depending on the outlook. So within that intensity, what do you think after like being on the outside and the other side of the experience, what was the most intense moment that like kind of like maybe jars you, whether it was spiritual, maybe it happened in someone else, maybe um, during these lessons or um, experiences that you all had trying to use your vessel for the next level, what moment strikes your mind when you hear that? Like what, what do you remember as something that might have been like kind of so, maybe it made you feel so enlightened it was alarming or you saw spiritual movement someone else something what was like bizarre and intense to you within this wow that's a good question yeah <laughs> and, and, and the response to it uh, is a big picture <laughs> but i'm gonna you know and it's something that certainly has come up in the media but um Let's see. It, it's a it's a real long story, really, actually. But uh, I'm gonna have to just go to the, uh, the actual moment, uh, which has been in documentaries. I think Weiss did it uh, with me talking about the first person that Doe approved because that person wanted to have the castration experience. And I was there for that. I witnessed that. Because there was a nurse, uh, the person who did the operation uh, had worked for an orchiectomist, uh, and she was a registered nurse. And so her job was to assist the surgeon in removing the testicles of, uh, um, people that had cancer generally. So like when we talk, just to butt in really quick, because when I thought about the castration that the group did, I thought like a eunuch, like every <coughs> was removed, mm. which is pretty alarming. That was what my, my mind <laughs> went with. That was me yeah. too. And he's like, no, that's not what castration yeah. is at all. I'm like, no, what are you talking about? Like everything gets locked off, right? Like it's all gone. But that's not what the group did. They removed the testicles. Which is a very <laughs> easy procedure actually. Exactly. It's not that complicated at all. But, well, but you know, 
uh, there were two of us that um, were petitioning Doe to have that opp that opportunity. If you want to look at it that way. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, for over a year or more than that, from when it first came up. But Doe didn't want to give us the go ahead for it. Uh, because he thought we needed, we still needed the experience of dealing with our sexuality by allowing those hormones to still flow through our bodies. And so, uh, but, but he and Sorodi and I, individually, we didn't know what the other one was doing. We had communication with Doe all the time, through notes, and sometimes in person, and some, you know, sometimes on the phone, depending on the circumstances. But, uh, but what we each didn't know about each other was what we were saying to Doe about if, if he ever felt to go ahead with that approval of that procedure, <coughs> that we wanted, to be, we wanted to have that procedure. So, so about a year after we were doing that petitioning, and then it stopped and maybe we were still doing it on occasion, which I did, uh, uh, we got a phone call from Doe and he said, uh, come to the, where he was living. And we were living in warehouses at the time. They were very modern, uh, clean warehouses in Southern California. And uh, and it was about 1991 or two, early two. And uh, so Sorodi and I knew where it was, and we went there. And he had set up a, a surgical room in like one of the offices of that warehouse. And uh, it was clean, it was a small room, and uh, you know, they had the table. And uh, Livodi, who was the registered nurse, was the one that was going to do the operation, uh, uh, had gathered the tools that she knew needed for the procedure. And which, uh, uh, anyway, so, and then uh, there was there, Livodi, Jan Odie. Jan Odie was helping assist Livodi and the surgeon and myself was there and I was standing next to Doe on the other side of the table and Sorodi was on the table but what happened was at one point Doe said uh, to me do you have any reservations about having this done and I said well my vehicle isn't looking forward to it but uh, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> But I'm overriding my vehicle. That's something that we did all the time, overriding a vehicle. Like if your vehicle wanted to, uh, you know, masturbate, you had to tell the vehicle to behave and not do it. If you wanted to, if you wanted to abide by that lesson program. Anyway, so uh, there were a lot of things that people did to control their vehicle. That was the whole thing. That we were a mind in control of the vehicle. You didn't want to let the vehicle do whatever it wanted to do because vehicles want to do all the things you know that they want to do. They want to get high when they want to get high. They want to go to sleep when they want to go to sleep. They want to you know eat when they want to eat. You know and but and they want to eat the kind of things that they want to eat. You know but but the discipline of the mind over the vehicle is part of, is part of the lesson program. Anyway, so I said that to him and he said okay. Uh, he didn't like you know give me uh, any response to that, that I don't know what he what he he didn't say anything about it anyway then he said well who's gonna go first and uh, <laughs> I'm sorry yeah no that's okay it is kind of funny it's an intense moment. Like, yeah. 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 I'm getting an answer to my question. Yes. Sir. And and Sorody and I kind of looked at each other. And, you know, the way of the next level would be to give the opportunity to your partner. You know, like if you you if go you're both first. You go first. If you, you know, there's the, the okay. old comic act. You, know, yeah. you, you both get to the door, <laughs> and you know, you go first. Oh, you go first. You go first. You go. First. You know, but. Be the way to remember the next level is to not put themselves first in anything. They're, they're selfless in the, in the true sense of the word that they want to be. They actually genuinely, it's like when you have a partner in the world and you really want them to have nice things. You want them to be happy. You want them to, you know, 
you genuinely love them. So you want them to do things with the, what they want to do, even if it might hurt you sometimes. You know, that would be the case if you really love them. But uh, so uh, so and I didn't care who went first. And so what we would do in a circumstance where we had to make a decision and we didn't care what the decision was, either way it was going to be fine. We would flip a coin. Yeah. And, uh, and, as we're, and I was standing on the side, and when the first incision was made onto the sac of the testicle, um, and a little blood came out, and they gave her anesthesia, uh, you know, um, I started to faint. <laughs> and I, I, I grabbed the table, and I, you know, I, and Doug saw me grab the table and said, you okay? I said, yeah, I'm all right. And, uh, and he said, you know, if this doesn't bond us, nothing will. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> well, it's very true, very, very true. You know, when you start doing things, anyway, so, so then she made the two snips of the two little, you know, the veins that provide the material to the testicles. And, and then sewed it back up and put the vents in, in, the, in the testicles so they could drain properly. And apparently she didn't put those vents in the right way, so the testicle sac ended up getting a little bigger. And Sorority was in a little bit of pain. And those said to me, and Livori and Jan already, and myself, he said, this is, this is terrible what I've done. Uh, you need to take me to the police. I need to be turned in. And we said to him, no, we're not taking you to the police. We'll take care of this. And we, we took Sorority to a hospital, and they took care of him very quickly, and it was no big deal, and Sorority was happy as a lark, and all the nurses liked him. That's what the reports were, because I, I was the one that went to the hospital with him, but that was traumatic. I was in that hospital, and it was so surreal that uh, Sorority was in the hospital, I was waiting to see what the diagnosis was, and I knew that if they found out that Doe was behind it, and he was the same person that was one of those UFO two, that he could be prosecuted for doing something, uh, you know, terrible, and he could end up being in jail, you know, for that, and it would disrupt the classroom, and and uh, and so it was, it was a traumatic moment for sure, a time period. And I was like, I was, you know, and, uh, but it was very easily remedied. Nobody was harmed from it, but because of that, though, put a, postponed my having an operation. And I was upset about that. I, I wanted to go through with it because I wanted to prove to the next level that I didn't want my sexuality anymore. I was willing to go all the way with that. And so, uh, and I wasn't even in the right place entirely. Because it was, it was still, in my mind, it was like a competition in a sense. And I'm not proud of that, but it's just the way I can, I can look back on a lot of things and I can see that, you know, maybe that, I mean, for all I know, that happened so that I wouldn't have that procedure because I still needed experience uh, that, you know, with, uh, well, I need experience, I need a lot of experience that I didn't get when I was in the classroom, that I've, I've got more now, uh, not just regarding the... Uh, My second question was um, regarding the actual incident where, you know, the vessel changing or, you know, um, vessel expiring. We all know the event that happened. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about your placement leading up to that moment, maybe how you felt processing it, maybe like a little talk about um, the interpersonal relationships with the people that were involved. I'm, I'm assuming it was almost everyone. There's like, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, no, that's right. And how was that to watch something that you were like very, very much, your whole life was invested in, kind of come to this peak in the media was also with such extremities, and then have those people that, you know, I, I'm sure 
I don't know what different levels of caring you you know you shared with those people because of you know your belief system and you know how you have all these different expansions but how did how did that all if whatever you want to speak on to, yeah. to talk about that moment yeah well i uh like when was the first time you heard mention of maybe that's how things were going to ultimately end oh well yeah you know, I, like like maybe where were we when you saw it on started like escalating in the media and it was like all right this is happening yeah well 1986 is when i found the book uh the hemlock society about um, all the ways somebody could uh turn off their vehicle you know die kill their vehicles themselves um uh, and when i saw that it was right after that we watched the cocoon movie where, where the people went out on the boat and though after that movie, which was after T left her vehicle, which is another story, but uh, he went out and bought a yacht, thinking that maybe you know that was a signal, a sign from T of the way that a spacecraft might come and pick us up. Uh, and so I remember thinking, well, if we go out on the yacht, thinking that we might get picked up by a spacecraft, I wonder if the spacecraft didn't come, if we would just decide to sink the yacht. And how would I feel about dying that way? And I thought, well, it doesn't sound like the best way to die, but maybe, but I don't know, it would be all the past, you know. I didn't think it would be a terrible thing. Um, so I didn't want to die, but I, I also didn't, I don't, I don't know how to really communicate this, but there's something more to a human vehicle than these bodies. There, a soul is a spirit, also. And that spirit doesn't die when the body dies. And that soul doesn't die when that body dies. It doesn't, it's real, it's totally real. I mean, it's, uh, um, it's actually more real than the human body because it doesn't die that easily by the flesh dying. And so reality has degrees of, you know, how long something lives has something to do with how, uh, how much life there is in it, real life. And not that these bodies are not living, but it's, a, it's not the same definition. Anyway, so, so that was 1986 when I found that book in Doe's quarters when I was moving his quarters. He left it behind. He had all his personal gear was gone, except that book was on the coffee table next to his, not the coffee table, the end table next to the, the, the bed that he was sleeping on. And that book ended up, I put it, I looked at it a little bit. I read the cover of it and, and then I, I put it down and then that book was put into our library. So that was 1986. So he, he probably had that book when T was alive, still in her vehicle, even though they weren't approving, approving of suicide at all at that point. And there's tapes talking about it. Because they, they knew we needed our bodies to learn lessons from. And they, they believed that right to the end, that we needed their bodies to have lessons. But they were with their older member, and they had the lessons that through that intense program of, for some of them, a lot of years. But for others, they had a condensed program. And the next level uh, took those souls out of those bodies when they died, however that happens, and they ended up going on a spacecraft. So I didn't have any doubt about that. I still don't. I feel like I know it like I know that we're sitting here in this room talking. Uh, it's that plain, ordinary way of thinking for me. But I can't prove it to somebody unless other people go through the same kind of experiences that they end up recognizing that. Sometimes people get some of that experience when they see ghosts and things and, and they, you know, they have premonitions and they start to identify that, wait a minute, there's a lot going on here that we don't know about, you know? And uh, so anyway, uh, but when, so, but then years passed and we didn't have any talk about anything like that. Doe was always T and Doe together. 
we're always trying to stay on top of what would be the signs or markers or indications of how and where how we were going to leave when we were going to leave and where we needed to be to leave because they didn't assume that the next level on their spacecrafts was going to take care of all that their task was to work with the system that they had work with the students that they had to bring the students to readiness to where it didn't matter to them how they left and it didn't matter to me how I left. It doesn't matter to me how I leave now. Uh, but right up until they left, they said in, in, on their website, it talks about how they considered staying until they got disease and each one of them died. They considered staying until somebody died because of an accident or something like that. Or, or somebody, uh, or maybe there was, they were doing something like this in a public meeting of some sort, and some irate Christian thought they were blasphemous and That's not to say an irate something. Christian only would shoot, you know, like, right, I don't right. want to call Christians it could be, <laughs> like that. It could be an atheist too, you know, somebody that somebody thought that, that religion bad. were all a bunch of baloney and uh, detrimental to people. They, we've been told that we, we're dangerous because we talk about this. And we don't advocate suicide. We're not saying that we're ever going to take any measures like that. Like, we don't encourage people to do that. We're not trying to start a new group. We're not, like, it's really hard to, like, run a cult. Like, there's a lot that goes involved with it. We have Like that darn, Netflix, darn. the Netflix show that was uh, that uh, Kathy and I were both a part of, but they only used life footage. Thank God. <laughs> right. Uh, um, how to become how a to become leader. a call leader? Yeah, it's yeah. a joke. We made them pay us. It's a joke. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Kathy like, made me actually ask for money, like which I never is. did before. Well, I said it's not true. Because they basically <laughs> said in the contract, like, we can make you look like idiots and what, you know, even made yeah. up stuff, which I made them take that out before we agreed to do it. But he interviewed with them for almost, for over three hours, and they used maybe 30 seconds of what he said. Whoa. It was intense. They don't want to tell the truth. They want to tell what fits yeah. their agenda. Yeah. And that, you know, look at the mainstream media. If anybody doesn't see the debacle, of the mainstream media. Uh, and that's the main focus that like we have with doing, with having Sawyer talk about like, this is like what really happened inside right. the Heaven's Gate group. Like when I first started researching, I was like, I had no idea what they believed. I just knew that, you know, 38, 39, including Doe, people killed themselves. It was like, and then I heard that they'd been in the group for 20 plus years. It was like, what the hell were they doing for 20 plus years? Like Most how, yeah, the majority of them, like maybe four or six of them had joined in the mid-90s. Mm -hmm. um, so I was curious, like, what did they actually believe? And then when I listened to the Beyond Human uh, series on YouTube, and you can also find it on Benmeo, um, the first one I listened to is like, I've never heard anybody talk like that, and I believe every word he's saying. I don't necessarily know what the hell he's saying, but... I believe that. It's hard to really understand that, because that's the way I felt when I first heard Do talk, T and Do talk in 1975. Um, but uh, sorry. So how did you feel when you found out that they had exited their vehicles? I wasn't that surprised because in 1994 we talked about the very same method of leaving. Like where were you physically? You found I was in Peter? Carmel, New York living upstate and uh, my partner at the time was pregnant with my baby and it wasn't me <laughs> right. And, right and uh and, she's a lovely woman and i was afraid to go to the public because i didn't want to have uh people on my doorstep you know uh, saying oh a cult member lives here blah 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 
you know, and so I, I went to a payphone, I still had them in those days, and uh, I called Time Magazine, I called Newsweek, I told them that I'd been in the group for a lot of years, and uh, I knew the truth about what was going on there, and they knew nothing about what the truth was really at that time. They said they were all young men, you know, all of them, because they had short haircuts, the, the females did. Anyway, but, uh, so, uh, I ended up going to interviews at, in restaurants with those uh, news and people. And then I ended up going to New York City and I spent three days there going from one media group to another one. But... He was on Larry King and you did, who was that other guy, Geraldo? 60 Minutes and Geraldo. 60 and Minutes, like he did the whole, he was on the, you were on the cover of the New York Post or something. Yeah, with the title in big bold letters, Death Cult. <laughs> <laughs> question is did that give you a spiritual feeling when that happened like did that affirm what you believe within that system was it exhilarating the feeling that you got when you found that out was it bittersweet or were you just indifferent uh, I mean it was a certain amount of shock but not that much really okay fair enough I knew they were gonna leave what were you like, wow, finally they achieved what they had, what the classroom had finally culminated in, in the... Uh, not really. I didn't really have a lot of thoughts about it. I, I, I just, what, what happened to me was I felt like, well, I got to tell the people the truth about this because I know the truth about this. And I, I, feel, I felt compelled to do that, and I knew that I wanted to do it in a way that wouldn't jeopardize my uh, partner and, and her daughter and, and, uh, and the, new, the baby that was going to be born. And then I, was, uh, then I had a book deal that was going to happen, and I had a publisher and I had an editor that was going to said that I could, I could write when I submitted my manuscript. And then that fell apart, and the New York Post published their book. But, uh, and so the story went away pretty much after it had been in the media for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, as a top story for a long time. And uh, the BBC came to my house and, and you know, they did pay me a little bit because I asked them because I was broke. I mean, at that time I was trying to make a network marketing business for Blue it. algae. Yeah, super blue green algae. Product, which is still right? a business. Which is a good product line. It was, <laughs> you should you know, buy some now. <laughs> at the same time, I was trying to sell blue green algae through a network marketing program. Uh, CBS and NBC were putting stories on the on the news saying it was a pyramid scheme and it was uh, you know you it was a Ponzi scheme and all this stuff. Well, and that it was pond scum, right? Yeah, pond scum they were calling it. When it was a completely legitimate a dietary supplement. You know, the people now know that spirulina and algae and can be very healthy to have a certain amount of, you know, in our diet. The but at that time, they were still like, you know, down in the dumps with the, the medical media. You know, the only, only their ways of doing things. You know, you can't use vitamin C to cure your disease. Like you know. some of the pictures that were showing before, like the cartoony kind of stuff was from the Transfiguration Diet uh, book, which is a book, it's actually available on Amazon. It's a book that the group wrote about the diet that they followed for quite a while. So it didn't have any uh, breads, any, uh, they use slow cooked grains. I was going to tell you this, you'll think this is really funny. I'm like, I can't have gluten and a, I have celiac disease, so I'm basically on the transfiguration yeah, so diet. Yeah, like, you know, like, like he got Lyme's disease yeah. and thought he was going to be crippled right. for the rest of his life, and he used that diet to basically cure himself. So right. It's like you don't eat any, it sounds disgusting, but mucus inducing foods. So, like, you don't eat any bread no or. No animal products at all. Yeah. yeah, and it's no, veg uh, sugar. vegetarian and no, no cheese refined either. Sugar. You could have you know, like uh, no honey milk. Mm -hmm. or maple syrup. But it's even a the diet. Yeah, it's pretty strict. It's pretty bland. Um, it's not necessarily bland, but a lot of cayenne pepper. I made some of the recipes and it was kind of bland. But <laughs> yeah, very careful <laughs> use of cayenne pepper. Yeah, cayenne pepper. Cleaned out this body <laughs> of that, that tick. 
a Lyme disease. Now I had this big ring on my back, and I was crippled. I was, my, my legs were blown up. And couldn't couldn't bend them. Because he lived in Vermont for several years. He was, he's like a mountain man, chopping wood and living off-grid, kind of. But. Okay, yeah, did so did we? Did he yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. Thank you. I hope so. You. Know, it's <laughs> you. <laughs> you. He's, 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 you and the uh, <laughs> Uh, can you just tell me the etymology of all of the names, and what is the period of adjustment? How were they selected? Well, uh, yeah, the names, uh, people chose their own names, for the most part. Uh, but in my case, I, cho I chose the name that somebody else had that I didn't know about at the time. And so Doe gave me a different name. Uh, he named me Sawyer, because I was also the woodcutter, and because I had experience with a chainsaw before I joined, and we needed a chainsaw for certain things that we were doing. We well, were clearing areas for putting tents up and things, we were building these ramps so that we wouldn't be walking around in the mud. And anyway, so uh, so they took the, whatever name we had chosen for ourselves and shortened it to three letters, getting rid of the vowels most of the time. Most of the time. And so the name Sawyer got reduced to SWY. And then they added what would be considered to be like a family name, uh, like a last name of ODY, which uh, um, they ended up dropping the Y. Uh, well, they said that when we became adults, because we were considered to be the like children in the next level. Which we were. Compared to T and O, we are children. And, and somebody is not going to know that. They're going to think that's a bunch of baloney, that we are brainwashed to think that. Uh, but if they were actually, could actually pay attention to the audio tapes that they made over all those years, from 1982 to 1997, um, and actually consider that maybe they were who they said they were, uh, you would see I mean, there, even if you didn't consider that, even if you listened to the techniques that they were giving us on how to take control of these vehicles and how to have life with, have working with each other as a crew and really being happy in, in, in following procedures, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not, it, it's, it's beautiful. It, there's nothing better. It's actually, uh, if, if humans would experience that, I mean, humans do experience it. We humans, all, I consider myself a human, but I had this very above human experience. And I still have some of that mind in this vehicle. So I'm a little bit schizophrenic in that regard. But, uh, you know, consciously schizophrenic. But not really in the technical terms of that definition. But, uh, you would see, you would, you'd be able, you can see that, um, well, let me put it this way. There's planets that exist that don't have the lower forces on them. So there's no killing, there's no stealing, there's no, uh, you know, there's no, there's, but there are lessons. There still are lessons because families have lessons. Children present lessons to families, and, you know. And, uh, people in the workplace have lessons of working with each other. And you know, some people, you know, there's still going to be characteristics of the human kingdom, just like there's characteristics in the animal kingdom, where they don't get along and then they do get along. And they help each other sometimes and they, sometimes they fight against each other. But in the next level, they don't have fighting against each other. None of that. But they have tasks. They have jobs. They work on amazing circumstances in our space. And they don't die. And they don't have to eat. But they might take a pill once in a while, some of the vehicles, so that they have a certain amount of nutrition. But they don't have an excrement. They don't have to deal with any of this. But they have fun. It's like if people have fun now on computers and on their phones and things, you know, imagine, imagine 100 years ago if you told somebody that fun was going to be for you watching a video on the screen of somebody else having fun. 
you know, you would think. <laughs> what kind fun, of fun? You know? Okay, well, I don't want to do that. I, you know, I want to run around and, you know, and throw a ball back and forth. You know, that's more fun for me. But, you know, but, uh, so we can't really imagine they're fun except for the ways that we have fun doing things with computers. And, but helping people is also fun. And they work with people on this planet all the time. So the names were because you guys were a family. Yes. And kind of to separate you. It's like being in the world, but not of the world. Right. Right. I mean, Did that answer your question? Yes, and I just realized my name's already there because I don't have any vowels in my first name <laughs> at all. <laughs> just add an O D Y. <laughs> yeah, there are people that are doing that. They're taking O D names, right. and I, I don't. Yeah, because like that's a, those are names that Doe gave to people. So like, because there's like there's several people that are like, well, what would my O D name be? It's like mm, I guess Ask Doe. And if you think you can get an answer, then that's your OD name, I guess. But that class, and that's why we don't, we're not trying to have a group or advocate for anything like that because our older members are not present on the planet. Um, that classroom was what they were doing, not what anybody else is capable of doing. That would be real and from the next level. From in the blue. Just so. One question that I had based on what you were saying earlier was there, it was basically a very close knit group. Y'all kind of, you said cut off at about 100 and it was meant to be this experience shared for this specific group. So I guess my question with that is why <coughs> were there things like a website? Why was there, you know, videos posted that were showing the messages and uh, things of that nature if it was initially meant just to be for such a tight circle was it sort of like a you know everlasting message after everything's done to continue the messages have it alone or was it more like um, just there for people who would potentially be interested so like the beyond human series was broadcast on satellite on uh, the Christian uh, channel. <laughs> and basically, and even the meetings that they did back in the 70s, 75 and 76, was because T and Doe knew that all of the souls that, had, that were returning to this planet to try to inhabit a body, a vehicle, to overcome the body and graduate into the next level. They knew that all of those souls were present on the planet at the time that they were here. And that's still the case. Every single soul that came back from the next level that had not overcome, hadn't learned all of their lessons, they're back on the planet trying to inhabit a body and regain the consciousness of who they are, of who they really are. So those videos and the meetings were an outreach to find those souls in normal human bodies and awaken them. You hear the information and you go, that, I believe that. Like there's something about that that's, that's tugging at me. Like I wanna know more about it. When I heard the information, it was like, well, what do I do now? Like how do I practice my religion? Or you know, like how do I learn more about it? And that's when I found him and what he was teaching. And, and then I was led to the audio tapes. And so I'm going through the, there's, there's a 920 that we have access to. So I'm on 190 right now. Um, so I've listened to 190 audios and they're about an hour each. And then we also listened to, uh, he wanted to listen to the audios from when he left the group in 94. So we listened to 95, 96 and 97. We listened to those years. Um, so it was to find the souls. It wasn't like indoctrination or, you know, trying to recruit people. It was just, here's the information. If you're drawn to it, then you can join us. Here's the, there's actually in the book, there's a list of requirements for proposed students, for prospective students. But at the end of it, or at the beginning of it, it says, this classroom is no longer offered. So it's like, don't, no, no one's joining us. We've already got everybody in the group that's going to be in the group. I don't know. Right, so, right, yes. Uh, 
the Siva, Tindo, they would receive information from the next level, older members who are on spacecrafts. I know that's hard to believe, but whatever. But um, but they would they would get impressions, they would get ideas, and they didn't necessarily know it was from the next level because they would think about it whether because they knew the lower forces could actually mimic try to mimic the next level and give them ideas. So they had like a, a system of checks and balances that they went through of the characteristics of the information they were getting to see if it would jive with what they knew about the next level in order to decide whether to bring that to the student body as the next step. Now, I know that's a very generalization, but at first, the, their, they felt that their job was to help us basically clean out our vehicles of our humanness. But then they felt like after a number of us were, you know, some people left all the time, people were leaving. And sometimes they would be given the opportunity to come back, but sometimes they didn't know where we were, so they didn't have that opportunity. And sometimes they would find us in a, in a, in a more extraordinary way, by some, seemingly by accident. Like but, by watching the Beyond Human series, that was part of the reason they put that out too, was for people yeah, that had some been of the people the that had left that maybe they would see that and see the contact information at the end of it. They had a P.O. box that you could write to. And then some they, members came back that way. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> then, then they got to a point to where uh, they, they felt like the next level gave us an additional task. And that was to deposit thoughts to the people in the world. And so we were doing that because what they said was that all humans are connected with a root system uh, of mind. And it's, uh, it's not just the ancestry of the bodies that we're connected with. We have that too. But there's a genetic mind that's also connecting everybody. And, and it's, like, it's like a tree. You know, you've got all different veins. But it's all of the human kingdom. Okay, so, so like if you got somebody, like you're in a room and there's a whole bunch of, and there's some people that are having thoughts that are, that could even be thoughts that are negative about something, right? You know, or positive, whatever it is. We can be affected by that. We can start to hear those thoughts ourselves and we can think, is that my thought? Or is that? that we can question where it's coming from, especially if it's not, not a thought that we're familiar with. It's because, and you can get so sensitive to your own, knowing what your own thoughts are, um, that then you can, you can walk into a room and you can feel like, wow, this is a, I don't feel so good here, you know, I don't, I don't think I want to hang out here, you know. You might not know why, and maybe there's no reason for it, but, there's all kinds of sensitivities to the unseen world. Because uh, there's, there's dead humans around all of us, all the time. And these human vehicles are like time-shared computer systems. And the dead actually are going through us. And they start that relationship right from when the vehicle is born. Through the parents or, the up, or whatever the caregivers are of that, that vehicle. Um, are influencing us, and we have it in our genetic structure, the influence from the past, and uh, and then any of the, and then the things of society that, and, and our, all we are is the chooser. We choose what to do, what to think, what to, you know, basically what to Pretty do, well. what to think, and about everything. And, and so, the choices that we make that are taking more control of the vehicle are more like next level choices. Okay, but of course that can be taken to a, an extreme too, you know, to where you're saying, are you going to go kill somebody? You know, that's the choice, you know, that's not a next level choice. Right. But anyway, so, 
So whenever we were conquering things, um, because the individuals in the, that were associated with the students uh, as students of the older <coughs> people, their minds are very powerful. Uh, their mind, their thoughts go out to the it, 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 the whole human kingdom is actually set up ahead of time with the options of what to pull on, like what inventions they can pull on, and and that uh, there has to be a, a evolution of choices to where humans can get to the point to where they can say, oh, I wonder if electricity could be harnessed. You know, I see those lightning bolts and they cause fires and they, you know, I see people light up or whatever. Oh, you know, uh, I wonder if that could be harnessed in some way. And so the next level knows that and they give that person actually a sense of how they can start on the road of discovering the uses of electricity. If the if they didn't, next level didn't give that to them, they would never think about it. Like animals won't think about doing things for humans unless the humans actually teach them to do things. It's the same kind of relationship. So the next level has been working with the, uh, the whole kingdom. And so the individuals that are working directly with the older members, their thoughts are actually uh, going out to the strain of humans to help them with those same things of overcoming addictions to substances. And, uh, and like an example was uh, the way that you know, tobacco was being used. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with using tobacco. It's just but it will give you cancer, right. eventually. Yeah, it can give you emphysema and all kinds of problems, you know, associated with it. So it's not necessarily the best to have it to have. But, uh, so right away, joining the classroom, they wanted to, they said that if you're going to be in this group, then no smoking, no use of substances, no uh, alcohol, no sexuality, no, they were getting rid of all the things that we were accustomed to having in our lives, some of us, and uh, that was part of the classroom. And so by us rejecting those thoughts when they would come to us, we were sending our strain out, the same help with strength to reject those thoughts and to where all of a sudden now the government was then putting labels on cigarette packages, you know, saying that it's dangerous for your health and things like that. So, and the same thing with the women's suffrage movement, so that women could be equal with men, even though they were always equal with men, but the women men were taking advantage of, you know, their muscles. The natural health food. Okay. Yeah, the natural health food movement that started in the mid-1800s. Gender consciousness. Gender consciousness, uh, you know, getting past that. Uh, um, um, not judging people by uh, disabilities and, uh, or, or you know how much weight they have or how much weight they don't have or you know their appearances and all, all that human judgments and nothing to do with the soul. The soul doesn't have any of those characteristics, and so if you're gonna if you're gonna identify only with the soul, which is a member of the next level potentially, then you have, to, you have to abort those thoughts. You don't have to do it. Tiendo didn't have any ways of forcing us to adopt all these rules. Uh, in, in fact, when they did give us an exercise of some sort, or a mantra, or a, you know, you could call it that, or, or a med certain meditation, they would require it of us for a week or two, and then it would become optional. Like listening to tapes over again, like all those tapes that Kathy was talking about that they made over the years, they encouraged us to listen to them over and over again. But they didn't have a program to listen to them over and over again. They, could, they said to us that if, if they could play them in our sleep and we would learn from that, they would do that. But it doesn't work that way. We have to put out the effort to do it. You have we to pull it through your conscious mind. Yeah, and by doing that, we're also sending those signals out. But then it got to a point to where Tiendo felt like we needed to do more conscious sending out of thoughts. And after T left, 
Doe started to think, well, I don't really want to change anything that T did. But then he got a strong signal from T that, that he needed to change some things. And he started to think, well, do I need to go public again? You know, uh, And if I do, how? And so he started, he started different ways of investigating going public again. And that's what was born out of that was uh, the Beyond Human series. And, uh, and actually, I don't know if uh, people are familiar with the scriptures, but the seven thunders in well, Revelation 10. Well, before we get into that, should we take another quick break and then we'll uh, wrap up with the rest of the questions? Because I see it's 8.30 and we're due out of here by 9.30. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I go, so, you know, I see people asleep and true. But Nobody's sleeping. <laughs> Back to, at first I went to Arizona because Don said, you know, where do you want to go? And I told him that I wanted to leave. And he, uh, I said, well, maybe I could go to Arizona because there were some other former members there that I could, you know, stay with. Well, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. And so I, uh, so he said, okay, well, I'll give you a plane ticket to there. And he gave me $600 and, and took me to the airport. Not Doe personally, but, uh, you know, st some students. So and somebody asked why you left the group? Yeah, I left the group because I thought I had learned everything I needed to learn. <coughs> and I wanted a task that I thought was like Doe had. I was too full of it. I thought I was more advanced than I was. And that was proven to me. Because uh, right after that happened, right after I started asking for that, I was, t I was talking to T directly, and T was outside her body at the time. I mean, I didn't see her in my mind, but, uh, but I felt like I got a response from her, and I, I ran by Doe, and I said, I, I, I asked T this question, and, and, and she said this, mm -hmm. and if it would, I don't know if it was T or not, and he said it sounded like something T might say. Is what the response was. So I, I felt like I did, was able to communicate with T. Now that's a, it's a big story. So I, I, I was at this job that I had, and I started, I would take breaks, because I'm a programmer, and I felt like I was like wired. And we were, right at the time in 1992, when the David Koresh thing happened, and we were talking about going public at the time. And there was, uh, and I would go out, I would take a walk around the, Technical Park, where I was working in South Denver, and uh, and I would you know, like saying the key in my head, you know, I want a more challenging task. I don't want to do a task like Doe was doing. You know, I want to be able to, you know, lay it on me. You know, give me all everything you got, kind of thing. You know, so that I can grow, do that. And right after that. <coughs> I started having images of sexuality in my head that for 18 years I had not had to deal with. And it was, it was, it was so overcoming that I, I didn't know how to respond to it. I didn't even know how to ask for help for it. And, uh, and I started, I, I started you know, giving into sexuality with myself. And, uh, and I, I tried to hide it from Doe at first. And he, he sensed that there was something that I was not being upfront about. And he asked me about it, and I told him what I was doing. And uh, so anyway, it, it didn't change. I didn't get, I didn't accept the help that Doe offered me to deal with that. Um, it's like I became a different person. It's like I didn't even, I felt like I was um, deflated, you know, my will to do anything in the classroom was like, and uh, so that's 
also, at, at one point, Joe said to me, he was offering me help. He said, because I had been not like an overseer of task you know, before that, for years, to where he would give me assignments of uh, helping students in certain things. And, and, uh, and so because of giving into sensuality in that regard, uh, which I knew would be the case, I, you know, Doe said, well, I have to take you off the overseer town. And I said, okay. And, he, and I, I said to him, I, I think I need to leave the classroom. And that's when we were in the New York area, right after we finished the 1994 public meetings. And uh, I told him that over the phone, because I, I had phone contact with him all the time, as needed, because I was an overseer of the group. Uh, and so uh, he said, well, don't leave yet because I want to talk to you about some things. So wait till we get back to California. And when we got back to California, uh, I mean, we talked about some things and then he, he said, well, I can, I want to give you the task of overseer again with uh, another partner, uh, Melody. And, uh, and I said, to go on the phone, I, I can't do it. I'd be a hypocrite because I'm not. I'm not. I'm still dealing with everything. And uh, he said, "Well, okay." He says, well, "I guess you want to be more objective, so you want to leave." And uh, he, he, he said to pass the phone to the uh, uh, other students that were in that location where I was living. And he said uh, he told them not to try to talk me out of it that I knew what I was doing. I was trying to become more objective, is what he said. And uh, so I didn't know what he was talking about. <coughs> it didn't make any sense to me. But I, you know, so I, I left and, uh, and then I learned of all the things that, that Tia told me before she left. She gave me three things. She, she sent everybody a note. They told us ahead of time that he was going to do this. She was going to send each, each student a note of the things that they needed to work on to actually qualify to become a member of the spacecraft crew that she, that she had. And, uh, you know, Doe considered her to be like an admiral. And he considered to be him like, like a captain in the hierarchy of the next level. And anyway, so... Uh, so I said to her, um, so and those three things were, likes to be seen as something special, seen as something special. I would argue with T in my mind after I left the group that, no, I didn't want to be seen as something special. I wanted to be something special. And then I realized that, no, if you wanted to be something special, <coughs> then you would try to become a member of the next level because that's the only, there are no special humans. I mean, I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that humans aren't good or bad or whatever, you know, and a different value and the next level sees the humans as doing their best in this circumstance and that circumstance. And the next level can judge us. And they, they keep us all, uh, they can respond to us. When we ask them for help <coughs> in whatever form, they will give us help. The second thing? Uh, so the second thing on the list was a little too pleased with self. And that's what I was demonstrating to T when I was saying I wanted to test like Doe did. It was like saying that I hadn't learned my lessons. I knew how to control my vehicle and keep it under control. And that I had done a good enough job in that. And I, I've had some indications that I was doing a pretty good job. Uh, you know, Doe would even tell me that sometimes. But then I think T sent me an influence, a discarnate or a, a soul, a, a fallen angel soul, that was the kind of influence that Doe had to work against. And I couldn't, I couldn't even measure up to it. I couldn't have any, I didn't have the strength. It's like someone being totally depressed and they can't get off the couch. You know, I mean, that's, what I recognized happened to me. 
because of my being so full of myself, thinking that I knew where Doe was at. You know, and I, I, try, thing. I try to find ways to help people recognize that just because we have a human vehicle that looks the same as everybody else, for the most part, uh, doesn't mean that the mind <coughs> is the same. Uh, I mean, it's like somebody has a skill that somebody else can't do. We know that they have some kind of ability or talent or skill that they don't have. But when it comes to the idea of somebody being <coughs> skilled in the higher, all the higher forms of behavior and ways and, uh, and um, it, it's hard to imagine that somebody's like that because we've been subject to all these religious people that pretend that they are teachers and all this. But though in T, they are the teachers. They are the only ones that I'm aware of on this planet that are that were really bringing the genuine next level information updates to this planet. And so next question. That's a, I know you had a question, didn't you? Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had a couple. Okay. Well, the first one I just learned because I watched all the documentaries. One of them is just very, is very random, but I know whenever they exited, they had five dollars and quarters in their pockets. Uh -huh. I just was wondering why. Mm -hmm. You watch one of them? <laughs> you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't there. You weren't there either, but I wasn't there either, but. You were there for 19 years. <laughs> yeah, I don't know for a fact, okay? Sort of don't know for a fact, but then again, it, when, in the beginning in the classroom, uh, you know, one of the things that we, we were living communally, so we didn't have our personal anything, you know, uh, except unless something, a certain pair of shoes only fit us, then we, that would be our personal pair of shoes. Uh, so we did have our own personal shoes, I should, say, I should take that back. But other things like shirts and jeans, and we didn't wear jeans actually, but uh, the pants that we wore, um, if, if they fit us, you know, we would wear them. So, so we didn't have our personal money either. If we had a need for money, then we would make a request to purser. That's what they call it, purser. Uh, for the task that we like, if we did, had to take a car to to the to the horse pistol, they called it, like the car hospital, um, to get an oil change or whatever it was, then you would find out how much it would cost, and you'd make a request for that much money. And thing. but uh, when you went to your job in the world, you would sign out seventy-five cents in change in case you needed to make a phone call while you were out in the world, because in those days there were pay phones everywhere, and they only cost a nickel or a dime to make a local call, or a quarter to make a, a long distance call. So. They actually had 575. Yeah. In their pocket. Okay. So that, we had that, we would sign it out, and we'd take it with us, and then we'd sign it back in if we didn't use it. If we did use it, then we'd make a report on what we signed back in, or what we, what we spent it on. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so then a little time passed and they included five dollars actually in the envelope that was money that you would sign out because they were, didn't want people to be accused of vagrancy if for some reason, I don't know, I didn't hear that actually the person, but I heard someone else talk about that on a tape somewhere. But, uh, but the five dollars, the way I thought about it, was in case you were doing a task and the task got delayed and you were going to miss food, experiment, you know, uh, consuming of lunch or dinner or whatever it was, so that you might get something to tide you over until you got back home to the house where we were living. And so that's what the five dollars was for. So you'd have 575 in your pocket right. as you were like going about your day. Right. So, 
So that's what I told the media about that. Uh, and I think they published it somewhere. But, um, but then, uh, after I left the classroom, one of the things that I became aware of was the story about Mark Twain and how he had created a movie with Edison, the guy that you know, invented the camera, I guess. And uh, it was called Captain Stormfield's Trip to Heaven. And in that story, he was depicting riding the tail of a comet to heaven. And at the fair, to ride the tail of the comet to heaven was $5.75. Whoa. Yeah. You know, and a comet, a companion object with the comet, you know. Uh, it was like, whoa. And, and it was like, that wasn't the only thing that happened to me when I was with So I was writing this book that's out there. And so I was putting things together, you know, and there was a crash that happened, a spacecraft crashed in 19, uh, 1897 in Aurora, Texas. Mm -hmm. Aurora means uh, basically light, the sun, light. And, uh, and Jesus said he would come back uh, I forgot in Revelation somewhere, it says, at the end of it, I think it says, uh, like the morning star, I think he said. You know, with the morning star for us is the sun. So I looked at that, but Tian Do never talked about that crash for some reason. They talked about the Roswell crash and the Aztec crash and, and other, well, not all, well, the Paradise Valley crash a little bit, but um, in Arizona, but. So I, I looked at that and I thought, well, there was supposedly one person I wondered, because it was 1897, and 50 years from that was 1947, when they had the Roswell crash, and 1948 was when the Aztec crash happened. And then they left in 1997, and 50 years is considered to be a jubilee in the Jewish calendar. And I was thinking maybe that 1897 crash was, because that was right at the time of Mark Twain, hmm. when he was really public about things. Uh, and you know, he said he came to this planet with Halley's Comet, he was born, and then he said that he predicted that he would leave when Halley's Comet came back, and he did. And, uh, and then there's a whole bunch of stuff about how the Mississippi River, where Mark Twain um, was a captain of a Mississippi River boat, measuring the depth, which relates to Revelation 11, with the two witnesses we talked about. Now, I can go into all that. I'm not going to go into all that because we don't have the time. But, but that the... Uh, the captain's quarters on the Mississippi Riverboat was called, it was spelled T-E-J-A-S, Texas. And Doe considered himself to be a captain, and he was from Texas. I mean, captain in terms of next level kind of rank. And that in Revelation 12, it talks about the woman and the man coming. And the woman is clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet. And the moon is the lesser light, dough, and, and she is the greater light, the sun. And, uh, and, and that um, the Mississippi River was significant to Tiendo because they said that it separated the east from the west, and they felt like whenever they were west of the Mississippi River, they felt closer to their next level connection. 